So thank you everyone for joining me today in another satsang, Course in Miracles Based Teaching. So as uh, I was in a 12-step Al-Anon program for many years before I came across the course and I did the two side by side for a few years and then I really um, moved into the Course in Miracles as my main teaching and I just uh, focused on that and uh, worked with the Holy Spirit and Jesus in my mind to clear away all the grievances, all the beliefs in sin, the belief in guilt, the belief in separation. So for many years, I would bring the Holy Spirit or Jesus. I just don't know why I picked sometimes the Holy Spirit and sometimes Jesus. I didn't, I can't tell you why, but forgiveness, I, I worked out that to get another perception, we need to ask the holy mind for another perception. We can apply the lesson of the day. We can do that as a way as well. So I worked with the lessons over many years, and then I worked when I strengthened the connection to the inner guide that takes time obviously at the start I didn't have a strong connection but we all can we all do we all have the Holy Spirit and Jesus available to us all the time there's not a time when we don't but what happens is we're fearful of the answer we're fearful of, fearful for so many reasons right so it's a slow evolving maybe over many lifetimes even. So we really need to sit back and relax and just do the best we can on a daily basis to practice forgiveness. It's a practical application in that we have to do something. When we're not at peace, we have to activate the miracle in whatever way that works for you. So it's not about just being in the ego and wallowing in it Jesus says this need not be I've given you a course to take you away from that so our part is to put it into practice that's all we need to do is try to give time over to silence to activate this inner voice that is here to help us and this voice is going to help transcend this idea that we're sinful, unworthiness, broken, a body, vulnerable, little, all these ideas that we've come to know through ourselves, through our choice for the ego. So today I'm going to start with a one of Helen's prayers. I put it up into the Facebook group this morning. It was just so beautiful. And interestingly, I just asked the Holy Spirit, I just call it the inner guide. It feels like it's just a one voice now. It's my voice. It's connected. It's like something that knows. And I'm an empty vessel. I'm, my mind's an empty vessel. The body's neutral. I'm, my mind's an empty vessel for something that's helpful. So it's like all I am is a receiver of. God's thoughts or something helpful through what we call a, a body it's like a having a radio in front of you you can't pick up the signal because it's got to come out through the vessel of the radio so is it <clears throat> teachers of God and we can all be it he says we only have to be in our right mind for a few minutes to have the message come through so we can all do this. So today I just asked for this prayer and I was guided to Helen's book. I was guided to the back of the book, flicked through. I saw this prayer, the soundless song. And how beautiful because last week we were talking about the song of prayer and the song of God. So just recapping on last week before I read this is that the is that where we are 
is in the creation, is the love and the gratitude and this glorious love of God, which is God, that we are in that and we never left. It's eternal, it's changeless, it's still on. It's never left our minds. We all have access to that beautiful, holy, vast, infinite love, this song singing to us. It's not like a song here, it's similar, but that is what God's like. It's like when if you've if you've ever had dogs and you come through the front door, the dog just comes up and loves you, no matter how long you've been away, no matter what you've done or said, the dog just wags its tail and jumps all over you. And that is really a beautiful symbol that you can use of how God loves you. So God is that dog's love constantly that never stops it's like a force that we're not used to because we live in a world we've made this world and we live in something where love is con by contracts I'll do this for you and you'll love me your love is conditional my love is conditional all this so <clears throat> this song of love and gratitude is in our minds and it's something that we is totally different to the love we experience here which is not pure love this love is special love and special hate mixed together so we are as core students today just using this meeting and these prayers and these lessons to let go of everything that stands between our, what's in our minds now and hearing and being in that song, being one in that song, letting our mind let go of everything here and just move into the song. So once again, we'll get an opportunity. I'm going to use words from, from the pamphlet to do the meditation today. So, but really what it is, is our willingness to just say, you know, for an hour and a half, I'm just going to let go. So when you get into the song, you can come back and you'll still function and do what you need to do, but you'll be living lighter. You'll be living more in this happy space, this peaceful mind. So you'll be in the world, but not of it. You're not going to disappear. The world's not going to disappear. Look, it might change and you might see more light or you might see different things, but you're not, there's nothing to fear in having this song or this peaceful mind that is available to us. And as he says, you know, it's always available. He, he wants us to know that we don't need to try to be a good person to get there. He wants us to know that we are already, as he created us, we are that now. We need do nothing except let go of the things that are stopping us from experiencing that. And he's telling us very clearly what it is. It's holding our brother as separate and judging him or anything, judging anything. So we'll once again get the opportunity to let go of that, let go of those obstacles, those blocks, and come. Just let ourselves come to that, come to God, come to the peace of mind. So this is the soundless song, this beautiful prayer that came through Helen Shuckman in her book, The Gifts of God. I walk in, oh, so first of all, I'll get you to close your eyes. We're going to meditate for five minutes at the end of this prayer. 
So I'm just going to read it slowly. I walk in stillness where my rest is set in heaven. And the silence of the stars sings in a soundless circle. For the song of heaven is past hearing and ascends beyond the tiny range the ear can catch and soars into a spaceless magnitude where sound and silence meet in unity. Holy am I who brings my father's name with me and who abides in him. Although I seem to walk alone, look carefully and you may catch a glimpse of him who stands beside me. And I lean on him in sure, unswerving confidence. It was not thus before, for I was bitterly afraid to take the help of heaven for my own. Yet heaven never failed, and only I stayed comfortless while all of heaven's gifts poured out before me. Now the arms of Christ are all I have and all my treasure is. Now I have ceased to question. Now I come from chaos to the stillness of my home. Just sit in silence for five minutes and just let your mind think about this beautiful message from Jesus.
Okay. You can remain seated if you like, just closing your eyes. If you'd like to just listen to me reading today's uh, words. So, you know, any time we read the course, it, it's sometimes good to remember that we're reading the words of the Christ mind that is not here in this world with us, in this what we feel is a world. It's coming from the highest level of holy mind to remind us of who we are. And so uh, we, it's, it's just nice to remember, to remember, to remember that. <laughs> um, because we may, not that today, I think today's reading's pretty, going to be sort of fairly easy to, um, understand and comprehend, you know, in the in the, what he's saying. But sometimes we can read the course, and there can be this sort of feeling like, I I don't believe that's true. That's that just sounds too far fetched. You know, like the teachings around time, and that uh, the script is written and things like that. So it just takes a number of years or however long it takes to hear these teachings over and over again for them to sink in. And there's, for me, what happened was there was a time where it felt like everything just sort of came together in my mind. There was like a linking in and I sort of all joined up and I understood how time and the script is written and, and the tiny mad idea was like, there was an understanding of it, not through um, the knowledge, but not through the thinking mind, but like a knowing. That's why I call it knowledge. And that, and with that knowledge comes certainty. So today's talk is the ladder of prayer. So we'll just say our little inner um, prayer to start with, just Holy Spirit be you in charge let any anything that i need to any any of these words that are said today um or any anything that happens here in the group just let's use this group for further illumination of my mind so i just let go and just or let to sort of like put him in charge and then listen and you know certain things might be like like coming certain words or a phrase will be will like stand out in your mind it's like all of a sudden they'll be like bolded you know sometimes there's big lettering and it's really bold something so there's sometimes a message that he'll use in this to really help us understand um our mind so let's go the ladder of prayer so what I how I'm going to do this is read it and let some comments come through that might be helpful prayer has no beginning and no end it is part of life but it does change in form and grow with learning until it reaches its formless state and fuses into total communication with God. In its asking form, it need not and often does not make appeal to God or even involve belief in him. At these levels, prayer is merely wanting out of a sense of scarcity and lack. These forms of prayer or asking out of need always involve feelings of weakness and inadequacy and could never be made 
by a son of God who knows who he is. No one then who is sure of his identity could pray in these forms. Yet it is also true that no one who is uncertain of his identity can avoid praying in this way. And prayer is as continual as life. Everyone prays without ceasing. Ask and you have received, for you have established what it is you want. So I'm just going to review these two paragraphs here. So at the start, he says, prayer has no beginning and no end. It is part of life. But it does change in form. So what he's talking about, he's talking, he, he's got this, um, this section called the ladder of prayer. So he's starting to point out that at the bottom of the ladder, we start with prayer where we aren't even making, a, a making an appeal to God because we are probably atheists or have fear God or have given up on God. So in this, um, these levels of prayer are just wanting. Now, when he says everyone plays praise without ceasing he means that even as a little child if you want a new teddy bear or you see something in a shop and you want that he's talking about our mind is even though we may not call it prayer he's using the word prayer in this way that we want something now, we might not say, please, God, you know, get mum to buy me the teddy bear or the doll in that shop or the train set. That comes later. That's sort of further up the ladder. The first part of praying, he says, is this just asking or wanting things out of life. So he's in this section, he's trying to get us to identify with the way we've been asking for things, wanting, desiring things of, in the world. So he's talking about this ladder of prayer and he's starting on the bottom and he's saying at the bottom rung, you're not even asking God. You're just saying, I really want this. Gosh, I hope I can get this gosh, you know, I hope I have this for dinner or you're just asking and he's telling us that this is prayer, even though we don't think of it. We always think of prayer as, oh, we put our hands together and we come and ask. But he's saying to us that our whole life is being a prayer without ceasing. In other words, we're in the egoic mind, wanting, desiring, even as little children, as sometimes we can have really lovely experiences being very playful and free as children, but we, we do have those dark times in our mind where we feel we've done something wrong. Our parents might tell us off. We think, you know, we, we're, the ego is saying um, to us, you know, how we're silly, we're stupid, um, with there's something wrong with us. So it is this way he's talking here is this we have to think because he uses he when he teaches the course, he changes the way we think about things or look at them. So so we're praying for we're wanting, we're in a wanting prayer. And we're ceaselessly in that. I want my sister be, to be nicer to me. I want to have my friends at school be nice to me. So we're always in a wanting. 
we're wanting, wanting, wanting. That's our prayer. So the, these forms of prayer or asking out of need always, always involve feelings of weakness and inadequacy. It could never be made by a son of God who knows who he is. So he's telling us to look at the way we've been, what mind we've been in, and that if we know who we are, we would be in the song of prayer, in gratitude and love with him. That's the highest communication. But the bottom rung is just that really basic, constant saying prayer, feeling weak and inadequate, and just asking for things. And growing up as young children and adults in this world, worldly, we, we're going to put aside that it's a dream. We're just going to look at it as we look at the ego life. Um, so everyone prays without ceasing. So wherever, so whenever, you know, even the baby comes in wanting some milk, has that feeling of desire some food and milk and comfort and warmth so we come in as into a body and the whole prayer of our mind is based on weakness and inadequacy and looking for things to comfort us and give us pleasure so now I'll read um, paragraph three. It is also possible to reach a higher form of asking out of need, for in this world, prayer is reparative. Now, reparative, just I looked it up and it means making amends. So it must entail levels of learning. Here, the asking may be addressed to God in honest belief, though not yet with understanding, a vague and usually unstable sense of identification has generally been reached, but tends to be blurred by a deep-rooted sense of sin. It is possible at this level to continue to ask for things of this world in various forms, and it is also possible to ask for gifts such as honesty or goodness and particularly for forgiveness for the many sources of guilt that inevitably underlie any prayer of need. Without guilt, there is no scarcity. And the sinless have no needs. So just reviewing that paragraph He's just uh, saying that the next level up is sort of including God, asking out of scarcity, believing that we're, we're deficient, that we're sinful, that we're guilty. So we're asking, you know, make me good. Make me, make me a nice person today. Um, and... Uh, different things like that, a vague and unusually unstable sense of identification has generally been reached. So, um, so we're starting to move up the ladder and starting to open to this idea of God, but we start to use this God as something that we think we can ask him to change to make us good so we we're not in true prayer we're moving up the ladder but we are still got a sense of sin for us that we're sinful we still have that belief and you might um I know I did I did all of this right so I can really identify into it I mean the other day um my sister she's not really interested in this spiritual journey but I think she's getting it by osmosis I never talk about God because she's asked me to not use that word when I talk with her but she said to me I I just said uh I said she said I might she wanted her car her car was um 
her car, her engine was broken and she wanted the company to replace the engine free of charge. And she said to me, oh, I just said, Jesus, Buddha, um, everyone, please let them uh, say yes to a free engine in my car. And uh, I said to her, uh, that's not really true prayer. True prayer is whatever happens, I will be at peace with, knowing that everything works together for good. So um, I wanted to sort of really quickly correct her or help her uh, in that. And I very rarely say things like that, but it was very strong guidance to say it because she doesn't really want to ask me directly about anything I'm doing or teaching um, because she's fearful of the word God. But she likes being around me and I'm always pointing her back to the present moment happiness. So that's all I say. I say, look how great this is. Oh, look how good this is. And, and she has started to change. She's moved down. She's living in the same suburb here. She's been here for maybe six months. So people around you can change as they are around you. But this, I just wanted to give this example of, and I did it too. I'd be, you know, please God, find me a better job. <laughs> um, all those sort of things, right? And it is prayer out of scarcity, but now we're including God. So we're coming up the ladder because we're starting to believe that there is a God and there is something, but we're just a little bit confused how to get get in connection with that, that creator. So over on paragraph four, at this level, at this level also comes the curious contradiction in terms known as praying for one's enemies. The contradiction lies not in the actual words, but rather in the way in which they are usually interpreted. While you believe you have enemies, you have limited prayer to the laws of the world and have also limited your ability to receive and to accept to the same narrow margins. And yet, if you have enemies, you have need of prayer and great need to. For what does the phrase really mean? In other words, praying for your enemy. What does it mean? Pray for yourself that you may not seek to imprison Christ and thereby lose the recognition of your own identity. Be traitor to no one or you will be treacherous to yourself. Now, interestingly, isn't, isn't it that he doesn't talk about an enemy? He's remember that any time I'm thinking about my brother, other than that he is the Christ, I'm doing, I'm seeing myself. I'm always seeing myself and never the images that move around. It's just me I'm seeing. I'm seeing the contents of my mind projected outward. So he says when we judge someone as an enemy, we are imprisoning the Christ. In other words, it's only the Christ before us. There's nothing else but the Christ, the pure innocence, the holy love of God before us. And we have changed him into something else. And we can never do that. So we need correction. We need the correction that I need to change the way I'm seeing him. So 
he is asking us to pray for yourself. Now, that doesn't mean to say, I pray that I can see the Christ in him. It means to activate that, to be willing to say, I'm going to not imprison him with my judgments. I am going to free myself by seeing him as he really is. Jesus is telling us that any time we are not seeing the Christ, we're imprisoning him in our other, in our condemnation. So one of the ways it sometimes can help you understand this is when, if you've got, say, um, green glass, green glass in these glasses, I'm going to see the world as green. It's not green, but it's what I'm viewing through that's causing it to be green. And the effect is that I'm saying, hey, everyone needs to go and have use this particular soap to get the green off them. But what he's telling me, and this is what we're all saying, well, this person did this and they shouldn't have and they're like this and but we can't see that we're the ones that are looking through the veil that's making us see them this way. And to pull off our green glasses, which is to say, I only want to see the holiness, we pull away the veil of judgment and condemnation and attack and comparison and separation. And we pull away those green glasses mm. and we see clearly. So we have to have this darkened glass that we are looking through to our brother changed. We have to take responsibility for that we have them on. There's nothing wrong with our brother. Jesus is telling us he is the Christ. He is holy. He is beautiful. He is lovely. He or she, just beautiful, gorgeous, light of the world. If he says, if you could see your brother, you know, as he truly is, you know, you would weep. And that's what I found. I found I like, I want to weep with everyone's beauty and holiness. But I too had the darkened glass on. So how do I see truly is I have to change the cause. I have to take off what is stopping me from seeing clearly. So to pray for my enemies might be a prayer, something along. He's talking that ladder, that second rung of the ladder where I'm saying, you know, a prayer, something along the lines, oh, can you make them be nicer? Dear God, can you, can you make them just speak to me nicely or love me more or be kinder to other people or, or you know, whatever it is, we're praying to God to change our enemy. Our enemy is someone we want that we think should change. So this is what he's saying. It's this curious contradiction praying for one and his enemies because he's telling us we have to change how we see him that's all we need to do we're seeing through the green glasses and asking God to stop making him green can you get him to shower with some soap to wash the green out no he's green his hair's green his body's green he's this is the judgment. He's nasty. He's mean. He's horrible. He's impatient. He's, he's silent. He talks too much. You know, whatever it is that you're looking for your brother to change, you're really saying he's green and I need him to wash that green away. Whereas he's saying, you're looking through your green glasses. It's you that has the problem. 
you can't see that the cause of everything you think is in him is coming from your mind. Everything, every single thing you think is in your brother is not there. It, you're seeing it through darkened glass, through the ego, to move into that holy mind. So we're imprisoning the Christ when we pray for our enemies, asking God to change him or give him insight or get him on the spiritual path or, you know, do you want me to give him the Course in Miracles book so they might change? <laughs> Or, you know, I'll get him to listen to a teacher or invite him to a meditation or something. No. And look, you might be guided to do that at some stage. But, but we, our role as course students is to change our perception of the world, of the brothers, of our brothers. So he's asking us to forget about asking God don't pray for your enemies. We take responsibility that if I'm seeing an enemy, pray for myself. In other words, take responsibility for myself. Tell myself I'm imprisoning a Christ. He is the Christ and I'm imprisoning him, him in my own mind. And, I'm, and by seeing him as not the Christ, I'm telling myself that I'm not the Christ because every message I'm thinking about my brother, my mind, because it's one mind, is telling itself that it's sinful, that it needs to change, that it's not good enough, that it's guilty. Remember, every message we think about our brother is always interpreted about our mind, about ourselves. So an enemy is the symbol of, his, of an imprisoned Christ. And who could he be except yourself, right? <laughs> the next two lines of this, right? The prayer for enemies thus becomes a prayer for your own freedom. Now it is no longer a contradiction in terms. It has become a statement of the unity of Christ and a recognition of his sinlessness and now it has become holy for it acknowledges the son of God as he was created let us never let it never be forgotten that prayer at any level is always for yourself if you unite with anyone in prayer you make him part of you the enemy is you, as is the Christ. So the enemy is you. They're all your projections onto an image of a body. It's, that's all we're doing. We're projecting from our own mind. Before it can become holy, then prayer becomes a choice. You do not choose for another, but you can choose for yourself. In other words, you can't make anyone change from being in their ego, but you can change for yourself. You can choose for yourself. Pray, sorry, pray truly for your enemies, for herein lies your own salvation. Forgive them for your sins and you will be forgiven indeed. Mm. So forgive them for your sins just means that anything I think is in them is within me, the belief I have that, I'm ha that I believe about myself. So it, 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 it's... He's using this word pray. When he says pray truly for your enemies, he doesn't mean I'm praying for them. So I just want to be really clear that he's using the word pray in a different way here. What he means is um, for my salvation lies in coming to see 
that I have got the glasses on, that I what I am seeing in him, I need to release and see only the truth, the holiness, the sinlessness. So when I perceive my brother as being green, I say, it's coming from me. I have the green glasses, the ego judgment removed. The scales from my eyes fall away. It's got nothing to do with eyes, but this is just an analogy. And my mind says, I'm going to see you as sinless. Jesus says, that's the answer to all of this. Please see him as sinless, as innocent, as guiltless. So that's that beautiful blessing, the Christ blessing in any way, in any words, however you want to use it. It's your prayer. So it's the prayer of sinlessness that comes in and removes the green off the glasses so I can see him and see my brother truly. And as I see him, I realize I'm not really seeing him because he's just an image. He's just hair and eyes and skin and teeth and elbows and fingers. But what I'm doing is I'm clearing my mind. I'm cleaning my mind of the belief in sin. So I'm using the relationship that I'm having to heal my mind. And we says joining, joining in prayer with your brother, which is what we did, you know, when we joined in the Christ blessing prayer. That's when we rise up in our mind and we shift these ideas that people are guilty and sinful and wrong and, and bad. Prayer is a ladder reaching up to heaven. At the top, I'm going to read this, but this is going to be the meditation that we're going to do. So I've got two more paragraphs to read and then we're going to finish and we'll do the meditation based on some of these words that I'm going to read now. Prayer is a ladder reaching up to heaven. At the top, there is a transformation much like your own, for prayer is part of you. The things of earth are left behind, all unremembered. There is no asking, for there is no lack. Identity in Christ is fully recognised as set forever, beyond all change and incorruptible. The light no longer flickers and will never go out. Now, without needs of any kind and clad forever in the pure sinlessness that is the gift of God to you, his son. Prayer can again become what it was meant to be. For now it rises as a song of thanks to your creator, sung without words or thoughts, or vain desires, unneedful now of anything at all. So it extends as it was meant to do. And this, and for this giving, God Himself gives thanks. God is the goal of every prayer, giving it timelessness instead of end. Nor has it a beginning because the goal has never changed. Prayer in its earlier form is an illusion because there is no need for a ladder to reach what one has never left. Yet prayer is part of forgiveness as long as forgiveness itself an illusion remains unattained. Prayer is tied up with learning until the goal of learning has been reached. And then all things will be transformed together and returned unblemished into the mind of God. Being beyond learning 
this stage, this state cannot be described. The stages necessary to its attainment, however, need to be understood if peace is to be restored to God's son who lives now with the illusion of death and the fear of God. So oh, that's the, the finish of this reading today. And uh, mm. we'll once again do a meditation uh, based on some of the words in this in this paragraph seven. So we'll, this week, we'll once again try to let go of all the things of this world and surrender to the love that we are. Come to our creator, empty. Really feel this opening up. So if you'd like to once again lie down or sit in an open way, it just helps. It's sort of a symbolising openness, that's all. So uncross legs, uncross anything. Feel yourself sort of sit back and feel the chest area open. It's like being open. It just gives a symbol of willingness and openness. So we might just before we go into it, I'm just being guided to, if you do have anyone right at this moment that you have a grievance against, you feel is an enemy, even if it doesn't, the word enemy doesn't, you think, you know, that sounds a bit harsh, just anyone that you have a little bit of annoyance or frustration with. That was my tummy rumbling, if you could hear that. <laughs> Just saying hello. So let's bring this person into our mind, whoever it is that we've still got, even a tiny speck of grievance. Might be a big one. You might feel like I've done a lot of work on this particular character. But he's really just a cartoon character that we're projecting onto. So let's let's just have that willingness. I see praying for ourselves to see a sinlessness is really saying, I have the willingness knowing that this brings me to the peace of God. This helps clear my mind and it's going to help my brother. I'm not attached to outcomes. But he says when we move into this beautiful holy mind and bless our brother, we're helping the one mind wake up. We can't know how but we're doing it. So just do a silent blessing to him in your mind. You can use the Christ blessing or whatever words you feel. So on a daily basis, we have to really be mindful of anyone that we're holding, any grievances or any, anything, any annoyance, irritation, we feel they should change in some way. So just say, uh, let that go. I just picture their big, smiling, happy face. Just a beautiful, big smile, laughing. Just say, I see only your beautiful, holy self. I let go of everything that I'm projecting onto you. We are released together.
Okay, so let's move into the next part of the meditation where we're lying or we're sitting open. And we just say this prayer of letting go. I let the things of earth be left behind. I let everything here go. I let go. And forget them. They're unremembered. I let everything of earth go. I see myself clad in the beautiful sinlessness of Christ. See this beautiful, infinite love within me and around me and as me. I surrender everything of earth. Let go. I let my body go. I let everything go. I feel myself raised up into the light of God. It's beautiful love.
We'll continue for another five minutes. Just in the last five minutes, try to feel a sense of gratitude. It's really deep. So focus on gratitude for the last five minutes. Just feel this gratitude for God. Sort of feel this grateful. So, so keep feeling this sense and put your focus on that. Okay. Mm. Come back to where we are, but try to bring that sense of love and gratitude and peace in with us. Carry it with us. So for those uh, that live in the States or in the Canada that are here, you will be you're in your evening. So just try to keep really quiet for the rest of the time between now and when you go to bed. I sort of made these meditations meditation these times these meditations so they're in the evening for you and that you can allow the time between now and when you go to bed and go to sleep the time for illumination time for like a deepening so it's really important not just jump back on your phone or something and, and start texting or looking up things. I mean, if you need to do something, of course. But if you can, just give over that time, even if it's another half an hour, an hour. But if you can give over all that time between now and when you get into bed, lay your head on the pillow. Really try to stay in that 
part of your mind that is resting. Just sort of that you might have had a holy instant during the meditation where you felt that peace or you felt that releasing something other, something other than the normal egoic mind that's just full of rubbish, right? And coming into a stillness or a quietness or a peace or a feeling of love or just even maybe feeling a lightness. It doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be the full song remembered. But we're making way for it. When we do these meditations, we're clearing away a little bit of the darkness of our mind. And as we clear away, that song will come open up to us eventually. So don't think that just because you don't have this experience of the song of God that something's gone wrong because any time you do anything, repeat a lesson, do a forgiveness, do a Christ blessing, listen to a teacher, you're clearing away a little bit of the darkness. You're scraping off some of that green on your glasses and it's getting lighter and you'll be able to see clearer and clearer. This is clearing our mind of its belief in sin and guilt, of the belief in separation. These little meditations clear the way. Everything clears the way, right? It's not that you have to do one or the other. All helpful. So my gratitude to you for coming and joining in this today giving it a go, being willing. I'm just here. we just turning up each week, just sharing, just leading you through something that might be helpful, but it's you that does it, not me. So I really appreciate you and I love you and I thank you for being willing and giving this a go and is coming to know that we are not sinful or guilty we're not this little tiny little thing that's subjected to all this stuff in this world that we are the magnificence of god created by the magnificence as magnificence magnitude you know he says know your magnitude and it is not um, arrogance to know that it is the truth so I'll see if I can release this, um, uh, try and find it so we can bless each other. Okay, so I've allowed everyone to bless each other at the end of the, I'm just going to turn off the recording. So thank you, anyone that's listening. I bless you.